Next, the murder of 18-year-old Michelle Moore Bosco. I was on trial for the first degree murder and rape of Michelle Moore Bosco. Never even met this woman. I never even seen this woman. I mean, obviously, as time goes on, the trail gets colder. I don't think anybody except the people that were there. I wish I knew what happened. Exactly what happened. There's been so many inconsistencies in here, I just I don't, don't know. Any of us will ever know what really happened that night. Five men came forward with information about the crime, but they gave five different versions of what took place. Only one of the versions matched the physical evidence, and it was a scenario prosecutors found difficult to accept. Billy Bosco and Michelle Moore met on a high school bus in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Once they started dating, the two were inseparable. There was just no one like her. I mean, she was funny, she was sweet, she was caring, you know, uh, just everything that I'd ever, you know, and she was beautiful. She had uh, very little self-esteem, and I didn't understand why. You know, she was gorgeous. Just everything about her. She was everything I ever looked for. After graduation, Billy enlisted in the U.S. Navy. After boot camp, he was assigned to the Norfolk Naval Shipyard in Virginia on the USS Simpson. Billy and Michelle married and moved into the Bayshore Garden Apartments just a short distance from gate number four of the Navy base. The newlyweds found plenty to do in Norfolk. Located on the Chesapeake Bay, it's home to the largest concentration of naval installations in the world. On July 1st, 1997, Billy Bosco was set to depart for a six-day cruise. Michelle cooked a farewell dinner and took it over to the Simpson as a going-away present. She brought it on board the ship, you know, in a real big Tupperware container. You know, and I, I really wasn't feeling too well, you know, when, uh, when she brought it over. But, you know, because she spent all this time cooking, you know, cooking was a little bit of a chore for her. You know, she was just starting to learn how to cook. Um, but I ate every bit of it, you know, because, I mean, she made it for me. So I said, I'll be home in about a week. And I said, I love you, you know. Just be ready for when I get home. And uh, she just smiled and, you know, we gave each other a big hug and a kiss. And, and that was it. Um, I never believed that I was going to, you know, that, that was my last goodbye. I was saying goodbye to her forever. Six days later, when the Simpson returned to port, Michelle wasn't waiting at the pier to meet Billy, as she usually was. Billy rushed to their apartment, and when he walked inside, made a terrible discovery. He found Michelle dead on the bedroom floor. It was clear that she had choked up blood, and uh, it appeared from the crime scene that she had been sexually assaulted in some way. I don't think there's any words in the human language that can accurately portray, you know, uh, what that feeling is like. An overwhelming emptiness and helplessness, just, you know, and rage and sorrow and just everything all wrapped up in one. When homicide investigators arrived, the crime scene revealed information about the killer. There were no signs of forced entry, an indication that Michelle may have known the killer. Under the dresser, near the body, was a five-inch kitchen knife with a blade bent at a 90-degree angle. Police dusted the floor and other areas of the apartment and found 14 latent fingerprints. They could not find any footwear impressions on the hardwood floors. In the living room, dining room, and bedroom, there were ashtrays full of cigarette butts. All were sent for DNA testing in the event the killer left saliva on one of them. At the autopsy, the medical examiner found three stab wounds in her chest that had perforated her lung, all approximately five inches in depth in a front-to-back angle. And there were five knife-point abrasions called hesitation wounds, where the killer started to penetrate the skin, then stopped. There were bruises and petechial hemorrhages on Michelle's neck an indication of strangulation. The blood on her face, aspirated blood, also resulted from the strangulation. 
Investigators collected semen from a vaginal swab and found a semen sample on the blanket. Scientists also found biological material underneath her fingernails. A rape test kit found no foreign hairs or fibers. The knife contained traces of Michelle's blood, but there were no fingerprints. The medical examiner estimated that Michelle had been murdered the night before her body was found. Norfolk police interviewed residents of the apartment complex for leads. The first lead in the case came from Michelle's girlfriend. She said that Dan Williams, another naval seaman living in the apartment next door to the Boscos, had made some inappropriate advances towards Michelle when Billy wasn't around. We had a suspect almost immediately, and that was Williams, who lived across the hall and was obsessed with Michelle. Michelle was very attractive young lady and he had been bothering her periodically. Although Dan Williams was in the Navy, Norfolk police handled the investigation and brought him in for questioning. I don't remember. Did you see anyone else in the building? No. Did you hear or see anything? He denied everything at first, which is very typical of defendants who are being interrogated. Williams had an alibi. He said he was in his apartment with his wife on the night of the murder. Daniel Williams first denied it, um, then came around and admitted it. Said that he first said he beat her, then admitted to stabbing her, admitting, admitted to raping her. He went over there and tried to have sex with her and she resisted. And from there things got out of hand and he felt that he had to kill her because he knew who she was or she knew who he was. In Williams' confession, he said he hit Michelle three times with his fist and once with a shoe. But there was no evidence of this in the autopsy. Later, when police told Williams that Michelle was stabbed, he changed his confession. The next step was to analyze Dan Williams' DNA. Everyone, except for identical twins, has a unique DNA profile. DNA exists in hair, semen, saliva, blood, tears, sweat, mucus, and other tissues. When scientists compared Dan Williams' DNA to the DNA found at the crime scene, it did not match. Daniel Williams had confessed to doing this. He had not implicated anyone else. You know at that point that somebody else must be involved with Williams. After his confession, Williams refused to cooperate further, so police questioned Williams' best friend and former roommate, Joe Dick. Joe Dick was a machinist who served with Williams in the Navy. Dick said he was on duty the night of the murder, but his alibi did not check out. Joe Dick denied any involvement in Michelle's rape and murder, and took a polygraph examination, which published reports say he passed. But homicide investigators told him he failed. After several more hours of interrogation, and after being shown a crime scene photograph, Joe like Dick shit. confessed. He's never gonna, this is it. Dick made a confession, and Joe Dick implicated himself, Mr. Williams was being involved in the murder, and indicated nobody else was involved in it. But there were a number of inconsistencies in Joe Dick's confession. Dick said that when he and Williams went to Michelle's apartment, he brought a blanket. He said the murder took place in the combination living room, dining room area. And Joe Dick said he covered Michelle's body with his blanket after the murder. Then left the apartment with the murder weapon. But the murder took place in the bedroom. The knife was found on the bedroom floor under the dresser. And Michelle was nude when her husband found the body. Billy Bosco said he was the one who covered Michelle's body with the blanket before police arrived. Joe Dick's fingerprints were not found in the apartment. And when investigators analyzed Joe Dick's DNA, 
they got another surprise. It did not match the semen or saliva on the cigarette butts in the apartment. Two suspects, two confessions, and no DNA match. Soon, there would be even more surprises. Nine months after the brutal rape and murder of 18-year-old Michelle Moore Bosco in Norfolk, Virginia, police had two Navy men in custody, both of whom confessed to the crime. But police had a problem. The DNA of these two men did not match the DNA found at the crime scene. While in prison, Joe Dick mailed a letter which was intercepted by investigators. In it, Dick said he wanted to keep a man named Eric from talking. About what wasn't specified. Within days, police identified Eric as 21-year-old Eric Wilson, who also served in the Navy with Dan Williams and Joe Dick. Uh, I couldn't say that I was friends with Dan Williams or Joe Dick. Uh, in fact, I never really got to know them that well. Joseph Dick, I just never really liked him. It was kind of creepy. And Michelle Moore Bosco? I never even met this woman. I never even seen this woman. During police questioning, Wilson told investigators he was asleep in his apartment on the night of the murder. We the night of July 7th, 1997. I didn't realize till about lunchtime that I was a suspect. When I left the interrogation room, because I had to go to the bathroom, and a police officer pushed me back in the interrogation room and locked the door. That's when I finally started to realize something was going on. Wilson said the interrogation went on for hours and was unrelenting. Stay with us here. Eric, we know you definitely tell us. I told you. I don't know anything about this more than you do. You raped her! You liar! I was in my apartment. I told you that already. Said that I was lying to them. That they knew that I had done it. They knew that I had raped her, but that I, they didn't think that I would killed her. And they kept on that throughout the entire interrogation. They showed me a picture of a young lady. And they asked if I had met her before. I said, no. And they said, oh, that's right, because the last time you saw her, she looked like this. And they showed me a picture of the crime scene. Uh, Miss Bosco was half naked, only wearing a t-shirt, and her head was in a pool of blood. It was pretty gruesome. At that time, I didn't know what to do. I was in shock, you know. And I pretty much stayed that way from then on. Police asked Wilson to take a polygraph test. They came back, and they told me that I had failed it. I still don't know what the right thing, what, what the uh, correct answer to that is. Because, uh, my lawyer had a polygraph examiner come in and he said that it said that I was telling the truth. And the interrogation continued into the night. Detective Ford played on my claustrophobia. He made me move into a chair that was in the corner instead of the chair that I was sitting in so that I was pinned in, blocked in. He started hitting me in the forehead. They were feeding him facts as they were going along, obviously calling him a liar, um, getting quite aggressive with him. And eventually, Eric pretty much started saying what they wanted him to say. And um, it was about the nine-hour mark that he actually um, formally read him his rights. They, at that particular point, got him into the sworn statement. I confessed to the rape. Uh, that's all. So when you say raping, what do you mean by raping? Forcing her to have sex. Did any of you all wear rubbers? No. Do you remember which color the couch was that the three of them sat on at first? It was white. On the night that this occurred, what was Michelle wearing? I don't really remember exactly what she was wearing. Uh, she was wearing a black t-shirt, though I do remember that. I didn't really care at the time that I was feeding into their lie. I just wanted Detective Ford away from me. Detective Glenn Ford declined an on-camera interview, 
but denied touching Eric Wilson at any time during the interrogation. In Wilson's confession, he said that he, Dan Williams, and Joe Dick went to Michelle's apartment. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Dan. These are my two friends, Joe and Eric. Hi. Mind if we come in? So, really? There was some touching and tickling on the sofa, Guys, and later, the situation I'm turned go bathroom, violent. Okay? Wilson said he left the apartment before Michelle was murdered. The forensics lab tested Eric Wilson's DNA, and like the others, it did not match. Three suspects, three confessions, still no DNA match. DNA is extremely powerful, especially if you have something like semen or somebody's blood on the clothes of a suspect or something like that so um, in terms of concrete evidence I guess you can say DNA is probably more powerful but a confession in, in somebody's own words with certain things to corroborate it can also be very powerful but the lack of DNA evidence wasn't the only problem facing prosecutors the day after Eric Wilson confessed he recanted. I did neither kill nor rape Michelle Morbosco. When I met Eric Wilson the day after that, his position very firmly was, I did not commit this crime. I was not involved with this crime. I did think I would be exonerated at the uh, time my blood test came back. Uh, I thought that blood test came back. It proved that this guy was not the one who did it. I should be let go but that wasn't the case. Eric Wilson was an Eagle Scout with no prior criminal record. After their initial interrogations, Dan Williams and Eric Wilson refused to cooperate further, so police returned to Joe Dick. And what Joe Dick said next blew the investigation wide open. He now said there were six men involved, himself, Dan Williams, and Eric Wilson and three others whose names he didn't know. He thought one was named George. A police sketch of George led investigators to 28-year-old Derek Tice, who had been stationed on the USS George Washington. By this time, Derek Tice had left the Navy, was married with a child, and was living in Orlando, Florida. He was a volunteer for the local ambulance squad with no prior criminal record. Derek told us that he had been arrested for the rape and murder of an 18-year-old girl. His comments to us is he didn't do it, that he wasn't there. When police brought Derek Tice back to Norfolk, he said he had an alibi, that he was babysitting his friend's child on the night of the murder. Tice willingly took a lie detector test. Whether he passed or failed is unclear but records indicate Tice was advised that he failed. During the questioning, Detective Ford was just right in his face that every time he said, I wasn't there, I didn't do it, Detective Ford was right in his face screaming at him, you're a rapist, you're a murderer, you're a liar. Tice says that detectives held Michelle's photograph just inches from his face during questioning. They told him if he didn't cooperate, he would go on trial and get the death penalty. Eventually, Derek Tice confessed. Dan stabbed her. I stabbed her. Then uh, Eric stabbed her. Joe stabbed her. You were the second to rape her, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Did you ejaculate? Uh, yes, sir. You stabbed Investigators now had one more confession, this time from the possible source of the DNA evidence. Yes, it's very hard to believe that, that, uh, that your son could do something like that. Then they keep yelling at you and telling you to just say it and it'll all stop, you know. And eventually you do. Eric Wilson made the statement that 
If they'd have told me I'd kill JFK, I'd told them that's right. I gave Oswald the gun to do it with. Police had four men in custody for the rape and murder of 18-year-old Michelle Bosco. Dan Williams, Joe Dick, Eric Wilson, and Derek Tice, all of whom confessed. And when police pressed Derek Tice for the names of the other two men who were there that night, the ones whose names Joe Dick couldn't recall, Tice identified Rick Pauley, his old roommate, and Jeffrey Ferris, a fellow Navy seaman. The latest version of Derek Tice's confession was chilling. Tice said all six were together in Dan Williams' apartment when they decided to go next door to Michelle's. Please go away. When she refused to open the door, they used a claw hammer to force their way in. Get a claw hammer and basically beat the door down, almost like a battery ram. Claw it open and break it down and go in. It was significant, and that was significant because there was no physical damage to the door. He at one point stated that they had gained entry through the apartment using a claw hammer. Why he said that, we don't know. Tice said they grabbed Michelle carried her through the hallway, kicking and struggling into the bedroom, where they held her down by her wrists and ankles. But the autopsy found no evidence of wrist or ankle bruising, and there was no sign of a struggle in the hallway or anywhere else in the apartment. Tice said that all of the men took turns stabbing Michelle to death. You told us earlier why everyone agreed to stab her. Uh, yes, that way if any one of us was caught for the rape, they couldn't pin it on one person for the murder. Because basically everyone was guilty. So y'all wanted everyone to be equally involved in the murder and the rape? Uh, yes, sir. The wounds within a very, very small area on the chest, within maybe an inch or two, within one another. And the wounds were all of the same depth and the wounds were all of the same angle. Tice talks about the weapon being passed around. You're going to have wounds that vary in intensity, wounds that vary in depth, wounds that vary in angle, none of which was compatible with the findings of the medical examiner. Rick Pauley and Jeffrey Ferris both denied that they were in any way involved, and Rick Pauley had an alibi. He said he was home and on the phone that night and had telephone records to prove it. Pauley had a telephone bill from his uh, home where he was on the phone to his girlfriend in Australia uh, at the time that the murder was alleged to have occurred. But police took DNA samples from Paulie and Ferris anyway, as well as from Derek Tice. A single drop of semen contains five million sperm cells. Only 100 cells are needed for a DNA analysis. Once again, the DNA from Derek Tice, Rick Paulie, and Jeffrey Ferris did not match any of the DNA samples found at the crime scene. You deposit not just uh, seminal fluid, but you deposit uh, skin cells, you deposit hair, you could deposit uh, 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 fibers from your clothing, things of that nature. It can be found at the crime scene on the victim's body or in the victim's uh, vaginal cavities, all of which were not present, linking Tice or any of the others. The DNA recovered from the cigarette butts in Michelle's apartment also did not match any of the suspects. And their fingerprints did not match the 14 latent prints found inside the apartment. Despite the lack of forensic evidence, Dan Williams, Joe Dick, Eric Wilson, Derek Tice, Rick Pauley, and Jeffrey Ferris were all charged with rape and murder. Six suspects, four confessions, and no DNA match. Sixteen months after Michelle's murder, Derek Tice was questioned once again. I don't know that. I don't Tice know. told a number of contradictory stories that day. At one point, he recanted his confession, saying he was never inside Michelle's apartment. Later, he said he took part in her murder. In another turn of events, Derek Tice said there was a seventh man involved, John Dancer. 
Dancer was an ex-Navy man who had been stationed in Norfolk but was living in Philadelphia when the murder took place. Dancer had an absolute airtight alibi. He was in Pennsylvania. He had been at uh, an ATM machine in Philadelphia earlier in the evening and had the receipt from the ATM machine which showed the time and the date and place. John Dancer's DNA was tested and it was not a match. Well, at this point, of course, we know somebody else is involved. When John Dancer's DNA didn't match, police interrogated Derek Tice once more. This time, he identified an eighth man who was at Michelle's apartment on the night of the murder. The last person who comes up with is some guy by the name of Scrappy, who is just a complete figment of his imagination. It's evidence of a false confession. It's extrinsic evidence which shows that parts of the statement are not true. So if parts of the statement are not true, then it casts doubt upon the entirety of the statement. It's the narrative that they give after they say the words, I did it, that will tell you whether they know the details that a guilty person would know, whether they can uh, lead you to new and missing evidence, whether or not the physical evidence will match up with their account, uh, or whether or not they're innocent. Dr. Richard Leo is an expert in the phenomena of false confessions, cases in which individuals confess to crimes they didn't commit. Dr. Leo has a degree in law, a PhD in sociology, and is an author, researcher, and university professor. Why would somebody be saying they used a hammer when there was no force entry? Why would somebody be saying they ejaculated when their semen is not found in the victim? And one reason might be because they're innocent and they've, they've been worn down or threatened, they just want to end the interrogation, and they're repeating back to the police the police's theory of how this occurred, which is an error, or they're just making up facts because they don't know the real facts because they just want to put an end to the interrogation and get out of there. Dr. Leo says most people don't realize police are under no obligation to be honest with a suspect during questioning. Police are legally permitted to lie about the evidence to say that somebody fingered them uh, an alleged or real co-conspirator co or to make up fingerprints or eyewitness or DNA or anything and then after you take the lie detector test they may tell you that you failed it even if you didn't really fail it or there's no conclusive results they might cut you off they might raise their voice a liar and a rapist they might move closer how do you think her husband felt fighting her like this and they're going to tell you about a lot of evidence they've got against you. They might make it up if there is no evidence. Two years after Michelle Bosco's murder, the question of whether these confessions may have been false took on a new significance. A woman walked into police headquarters with a letter written by a man in prison for the rape of a 14-year-old girl. The prisoner's name was Omar Ballard. In the letter, Ballard said he knew the identity of Michelle's killer. Dear Karen, hatred in my heart is thick. You remember that night I went to mommy's house and the next morning Michelle got killed? Guess who did that? Me. <laughs> it wasn't the first time. I sent pictures of you in panties, bra, and a nasty letter. And send money. Or you'll be with Michelle in hell. Billy Bosco knew Omar Ballard. Michelle's best friend had introduced him to the couple. I was just absolutely enraged. Uh, I flipped out when I got to, you know, I mean, I started throwing stuff and, you know, breaking stuff. I mean, it was just, you know, I couldn't believe it. Two weeks before Michelle's murder, Ballard was arrested for sexually assaulting a woman in the Bosco's apartment complex. And Ballard had been convicted for the rape of a 14-year-old girl less than a mile away from the Bosco's apartment a crime that took place just 11 days after Michelle's murder. The neck and strangulation injuries to the 14-year-old girl were strikingly similar to those of Michelle Bosco. Not long into the police interrogation, Omar Ballard confessed. He said he raped Michelle, then killed her when he feared she would report the rape to police. Ballard knew important details about the murder, and his story was consistent with the crime scene. He correctly described the murder weapon as a four to six inch knife with ridges and a brown handle. He said he stabbed her three or four times in the chest 
and said he took $35 from Michelle's purse, which police found open on the kitchen table. You know there's seven other people charged with this offense. Were they with you? No. Do you know any of them? Just one, Eric Wilson. That's one from jail. Have you ever talked to Daniel Williams? No. What type of sex did you have with Michelle? Vagina. Did you ever hit her? Never. After you stabbed her, what did you do? I think I dropped the knife and walked out of the apartment. Did you see anyone outside before or after this offense? No. Was anyone with you during this offense? No. Is there anything you wish to add to this statement? No, just uh, those four people that open their mouths are stupid. One more confession wasn't anything new. But finding the source of the DNA evidence would be. If Ballard's DNA didn't match, police were running out of suspects. After her murder, Michelle Moore Bosco was buried in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in the Calvary Cemetery, just a few miles from where she grew up. Michelle had been away from Pittsburgh for only three months the short time she and Billy had been married. After the funeral, Billy Bosco left the Navy, but didn't have an easy time of it. He had difficulty holding a job, lost weight, sought psychiatric help, and looked for some way to put this tragedy behind him. It still affects me. You know, I, I have my good days and my bad days. God forgives everything, but I don't. Not that I would ever wish this on anyone. But I hope that they're in as much pain as they put Michelle through. By the time the investigation was over, there were eight men in custody for the rape and murder of Michelle Moore Bosco. There was no DNA evidence against the first seven men implicated. But with suspect number eight, investigators finally got the break they were looking for. When they tested Omar Ballard, his DNA matched the semen on the vaginal swab the semen on the blanket, and also matched the biological material found underneath Michelle's fingernails. But there was also a complication. Omar Ballard said he committed the crime alone. It would be very difficult for one person to do that, to hold somebody down, to rape them, strangle them, and, and stab her all at the same time. It, that could, it's not reasonable to believe that one person did this. The defense attorneys disagreed. I would expect that there would be a lot of forensic evidence that eight people were involved with this. I would expect when I look at this girl's body that I would see all kinds of bruising on her arms, her legs. There is absolutely no bruising on this girl's body at all. Her injuries are totally consistent with Ballard's statement as to how he strangled her and how he killed her. They did find human skin under her fingernails. If she is struggling with a number of people, I would certainly expect there would be fingernail scrapings and DNA analysis reflecting the skin content coming from other people other than one person. Everything is totally consistent with Ballard. When Derek Tice refused to testify against those he implicated, prosecutors had no choice but to release Rick Pauley, Jeffrey Ferris, and John Dancer from custody. But they proceeded against the five remaining suspects who confessed. Daniel Williams filed a petition with the court to set aside his guilty plea because uh, my understanding of the essence of his petition was that he didn't commit the crime but he pled guilty and at that particular point my understanding is the judge said too little too late you've already pled guilty we're not allowing you to withdraw your guilty plea. So Dan Williams did not get a trial. Instead he was sentenced to two life terms in prison without parole. Joe Dick after Ballard came out was facing the situation he is he's deeply implicated in this he has made numerous admissions that were contradictory on their face but one thing that was always consistent was that he was involved in a rape and murder I think he was put in a very bad situation if he went to court he tried the case and if he was found guilty he would have gotten the death penalty so he went in and he pled guilty by accepting the plea bargain Joe Dick received a life sentence without parole he maintains he's innocent. Since Eric Wilson recanted his confession almost immediately, his case went to trial. 
The state charged him with capital murder and rape, to which Wilson pleaded not guilty. He says his confession was coerced. Wilson's attorney told the jury there was no forensic evidence placing Wilson at the crime scene and that the autopsy results were inconsistent with a gang rape. McCormick reminded the jury that the narrow hallway where these men allegedly carried Michelle to the bedroom showed no signs of a struggle. Really Prosecutors exactly point out that wearing, Eric Wilson's uh, confession demonstrated knowledge of both the apartment and the crime scene, that Michelle's sofa was white and that she was wearing a black t-shirt. Wilson says he knew this because police showed him the crime scene photographs before he confessed. My reaction to the pictures of Miss Moore at the crime scene were, uh, I was, I was stunned. I'd never seen anything like that. It was, it was unbearable. Uh, you know, one minute you're looking at the picture of this girl in a field, and the next they're showing a picture of a girl laying dead in the hardwood floor. This is a technique experts in police interrogation say should not be done. I can't think of a circumstance in which it would be appropriate because it contaminates the suspect and it means that if they are innocent and made the false confession, you'll never know. But the damage from Wilson's confession was too great. He was found guilty of rape but acquitted of murder and was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. If I could say something to the Bosco family right now or the Moore family, I tell them I'm sorry this happened. It's something that no family should ever have to go through. I'm sure it's been very difficult for them. But their anger has been misplaced in uh, putting it on me. And I'm very sorry that what happened happened, but I didn't do it. Derek Tice recanted his confession, rejected a plea bargain which would have granted him life in prison and took his chances with the death penalty by pleading not guilty. At his trial, the judge did not allow into evidence Omar Ballard's letter from prison. Ballard's conviction for the rape of the 14-year-old girl 11 days after Michelle's murder just one mile away. Or his two audio taped confessions where he said he raped and murdered Michelle Bosco alone. Derek Tice was found guilty of murder and rape and was sentenced to two life terms in prison without parole. Randall McFarlane was the jury foreman at Derek Tice's trial. He was troubled by the fact that Tice's confession says he broke into the apartment with a hammer, a statement inconsistent with the physical evidence. It was one of those unexplained mysteries. It bothered me. It would have bothered me a whole lot more without the confession. But the fact of the confession, it became just less significant. McFarland says that if it hadn't been for the confession, Derek Tice would have walked. I really think that but for the confession, you would have had but one solid vote for conviction on that jury. And I might be even wrong about that guy. Dan Williams, Joe Dick, and Derek Tice are all in prison for life without parole for the rape and murder of Michelle Moore Bosco. Joe Dick and Derek Tice have both recanted their confessions and deny they were involved. Eric Wilson was acquitted of murder but convicted of rape. He too recanted his confession. There was no physical evidence linking any of these men to the crime scene. Research shows that juries consider a confession to be overwhelming evidence of guilt. Once you've got somebody to confess, a presumption of innocence goes out the window. Nobody honors the presumption of innocence once there is a confession. The jury foreman in Derek Tice's murder trial admits that Tice's confession was devastating. We believe Tice, when he confessed to the police with the tape recorder running, that was, I can't, again, I cannot overstate the importance of that. That was the after, supernova after. circumstance of the entire trial. It overwhelmed everything else. After Brick had stabbed her, we released her, she fell. 
It's very difficult to believe, to reasonably believe that somebody would confess to a crime as heinous as this without, if they did not participate in it. But history shows it has happened. In 1984, also in Virginia, David Vasquez confessed three times to the rape and murder of Carolyn Ham. Vasquez served five years of his sentence before DNA evidence identified the real perpetrator. In 1985 in England, Richard Buckland confessed to the rape and murder of a 15-year-old girl. But months later, another man whose DNA matched semen at the crime scene confessed and was convicted. And in 1990, in Austin, Texas, Billy Jean Davis confessed to killing his ex-girlfriend. The only problem was she subsequently showed up alive in Tucson, Arizona. The most common reason is that people feel pressured or threatened or coerced psychologically, typically, by the police that they have no choice that there's all this evidence against them, and the only way they're going to get out of that interrogation room or get the deal that's been offered to them or avoid the threat that's being insinuated is by complying with the police's demand or request and making a statement or a full-blown confession. So uh, the most common reason for false admissions or confessions is, pol is either police overzealousness or police misconduct in the interrogation room. So how can police and a jury identify whether a confession is false? One way, Dr. Leo points out, is to carefully compare the narrative of the confession to the crime scene facts. Inconsistencies should raise questions about the authenticity of the confession. Another way is for police to videotape the entire interrogation. A videotape record can be analyzed later if questions arise about police misconduct or what took place preceding the actual confession. Presently, only Alaska and Minnesota videotape a suspect's entire interrogation. In the absence of a videotaped interrogation, research shows that a police officer's version of what took place is given more weight than the defendant's version, whose reputability is damaged by his or her status as a criminal defendant. People who've done things that they feel deeply ashamed of will seek to confess, to get it off their chests. And I really think that that's what Derek Tice, in a burst of monumental bad judgment, was doing that night in the Norfolk police station. False. Uh, most people who are guilty don't want to confess. They uh, have to be interrogated and manipulated and lied to and, and uh, sometimes coerced to make statements. Uh, and admissions and confessions, and all of modern psychological police interrogation is premised on the idea that you're not going to get a spontaneous confession from a guilty person. You know, I have the basic idea that everybody has when they go to a police station, you know. Police are there to help you. They're, they're, uh, they're your friends. Do everything you can, everything possible to help them out. Then you go through and you get assaulted by a police officer while you're in the interrogation room. There was absolutely no evidence of that. Uh, the police detectives in this case were very professional. Uh, it's not their business to obtain a confessions at any cost. So, what happened in the Bosco's apartment that night in July of 1997 while Billy was away on a cruise aboard the USS Simpson? I don't think anybody except the people that were there know exactly what happened. But from what we can piece together, they're at William's apartment. William says that Michelle is the woman that he fantasizes about or that he's obsessed with. And they go over there. Michelle will not let them in. They go out into the parking lot. They're smoking a cigarette, hanging out. Ballard walks up, which he very often did late at night. Somehow he becomes involved in the conversation. He sort of leads the pack. They go back to the door. She knew Omar Ballard, and she opened the door, and then they all went in. Hey. And from there, raped her. Stabbed her, to, probably to keep her quiet, because she you know, knew everybody. Omar Ballard's confession is very different. 
He says he went to Michelle's apartment alone. Ballard was the only suspect whose DNA was found in the apartment. He said they chatted briefly, and when she went into the bedroom, he followed her in, then raped her. He says he killed her when he realized she might report the rape to police. Ballard was the only suspect whose DNA was found in the apartment. Derek Tice's family believes this was a case of politics. Got the confession, and it's now what do you do with it? We've got to prosecute. I mean, we can't, we can't stand up and say, well, maybe we made a mistake. So in order to protect their own image, ego, for whatever reason, that they decided to go ahead and prosecute what I consider as innocent people. In this case, it's a charge that the prosecutors strongly deny. I think that all the ones who were, obviously, who pled guilty and who are serving time are, are there, rightfully so. They were all involved. If I knew then what I know now, I would have just said, I didn't do it, let me leave. But that doesn't, that doesn't occur to you while you're, while you're there. I'm not a big guy, you know, Detective 40. He's very overbearing, very overpowering. Eric Wilson, I don't know what to say about him. He, even if he, I, I don't, even if he did leave when the murder was committed, which I, I don't know, I, I tend to think he was there based on everything else that we know, but even if he did leave, this was such a horrific rape that I don't think eight years speaks to that. My DNA was not at the scene in either blood, hair, saliva, semen, or skin samples that were taken. My fingerprints were also not at the scene. You hear all these stories about people getting acquitted after 20 years of being on death row because the DNA evidence proved that they weren't there. And here I am convicted with the DNA evidence proving that I'm not there. Most people don't know what it's like to be interrogated in hostile situations by psychologically sophisticated police who've gone to schools to learn these techniques and that there are particular techniques that are implicated in most false confession cases that the problem can be solved uh, if, if police learn what causes false confessions and stop using those techniques, if they videotape, if they learn how to evaluate whether a confession is true or false in a more neutral manner, uh, this problem can be solved. Eric Wilson, Joe Dick, Derek Tice, and Rick Pauley have all alleged police misconduct during their interrogations. Detective Glenn Ford denies doing anything improper during the interrogations. On March 22, 2000, Omar Ballard pleaded guilty to the rape and murder of Michelle Moore Bosco and was sentenced to two life terms in prison. There's four other people sitting in prison right now who will never get out of prison. Three of those people um, may not have committed this crime. And if that has happened, that is, that's the ultimate tragedy of these people sitting in prison for a crime they did not commit. Since the trials, Billy Bosco has attempted to rebuild his life. He has a new girlfriend and is now working in a minimum security prison as a correctional officer. He says he has no doubts about the convictions in this case. Innocent men don't confess. I don't believe for a second that an innocent person is going to uh, confess to something as horrendous as this, you know, that carries the penalties that, that these crimes carry. Omar Ballard continues to maintain that he, and he alone, raped and murdered Michelle Moore Bosco.